So I finally got my hands on a OnePlus 6. There were apparently shipping issues. My floor number wasn't on the package. FedEx couldn't deliver it. Regardless, I now finally have it. So I finally got a chance to do the complete walkthrough. Now, if you're not familiar, a complete walkthrough here on this channel is where I try to go through every feature I possibly can on a new device so that you guys have all the information you could possibly ever want should you be considering buying one. I did make a couple of changes to this complete walkthrough uh, and I am trying to improve them. So let me know in the comments below uh, what things you'd like to see me add or remove, et cetera, to make these phone walkthroughs better. With that said, we have a lot to go through. Let's get started with the hardware. The OnePlus 6 is made out of glass on the front and back with an aluminum frame. It comes in three colors this time, midnight black, which is matte black basically, mirror black, which I think the name is pretty accurate on that one, and silk white, which is like a white and gold, but the gold kind of has a hint of pink. It's not quite rose gold, but it's got a little bit of pink in it. The matte black and silk white aren't too bad at fingerprint magnets really, but the mirror black definitely is. The more important thing about the colors, rather than whether you can see where your fingers have been on them or not, is that the color sort of designates what specs you got. The mirror black color is available in six gigs of RAM, 64 gigs of storage, and an option for eight gigs of RAM and 128 gigs of storage. The midnight matte black comes in eight gigs of RAM only with the choice of 128 or 256 gigs of storage. And the silk white only comes in one SKU variety with eight gigs and 128 gigs of storage. Not that you'd be wanting for performance even if you got the six gigs of RAM models. Six gigs is probably on par or higher than most of the flagships out there and eight gigs absolutely is higher than most of the flagships out there. The thing that this does mean, however, is that if you want either the matte black or silk white color, you're forced into getting eight gigs of RAM and at least 128 gigs of storage for a $50 upcharge. Personally, I think it's worth it, but it's just something to note. The screen on the OnePlus 6 is a 6.28 inch AMOLED 19 by 9, 2280 by 1080 pixel resolution screen with yes, a notch. Just like Huawei and Honor though, they had the wherewithal to put their own software setting in to hide the notch by turning the surrounding area black to camouflage it a bit. This also stops other apps from being able to put content within the notch as well, instead just using it as the status bar only. Above the screen, in the notch, we have our 16 megapixel f2.0 aperture front facing camera. Below the screen, we have nothing but a thin bezel. On the right side, we have the usual notification slider we're used to on OnePlus devices that can be set from ring to vibrate to mute and our power button that can also be double tapped to get to the camera quickly, a small feature that I really appreciate on phones that have it. On the left, we have our volume rocker and our dual SIM card slot. There is no micro SD card slot on the OnePlus 6, by the way. At the top, we have nothing again. At the bottom, our USB-C charging port that utilizes OnePlus's fast charging that they claim can charge the phone to 60% in 35 minutes. Fun fact, you'll notice dash charging, as it was called on the OnePlus 3 way back when, is no longer mentioned on the OnePlus stats page, but it's still on the charger. OnePlus said that this was due to an EU trademark dispute, but that it is still the same technology that they've always been using. Next to the USB-C port is the 3.5 millimeter headphone jack we've come to expect from OnePlus that they said, at least at their last OnePlus event that I was at, that they wouldn't remove until more headphones supported USB-C. And finally, on the bottom, we have our speaker that is tuned by Dirac with their Dirac HD sound controller, which basically means that OnePlus sent them the device and they tuned it to sound better using their own algorithms, and Dirac Power Sound, which has Dirac attempt to correct small speaker things like those found in phones, their frequency and impulse response, as well as optimizing the bass. On the back, we have our fingerprint sensor in the center under our dual LED flash and dual cameras that we'll talk about in a minute. The device follows the same horizon line that OnePlus has incorporated into their design language for a while now, and it means that it has a nice curve to it that makes it sit nice in the hand. It also weighs 6.24 ounces, which is a bit heavier than the S9 and LG G7, but lighter than say the S9 Plus, and it gives it enough weight to kind of make it feel premium. On the inside, we have the Qualcomm Snapdragon 845 processor paired with either six or eight gigs of LPDDR4X RAM. It has Bluetooth 5.0 with Qualcomm Aptix HD for higher bitrate audio over Bluetooth, supports gigabit LTE for faster data speeds where available, and is powered by 3300 milliamp battery. Now here's where I normally go through all of the apps and like list them out that have been installed on the phone. But instead for this one, I'm gonna just kind of point out the ones that are more standout for OnePlus versus any other device. 
First though, the device is running Android 8.1 with OnePlus's UI skin on it called Oxygen OS, which is version 5.1.5 at the time of filming this. The thing that everybody really likes about Oxygen OS is the fact that it is very similar to stock Android, but adds some serious optimizations that make it even faster. And it's why it wins basically every speed test ever. In addition to the optimizations, they have also added a few non-intrusive new features. Here are a few of the most useful. Reading mode. So it says that this detects the lighting in the room you are in and adjusts the color temperature of the screen, similar to Apple's True Tone feature maybe. Uh, and it's supposed to make it easier to read and prevent eye strain. You can even set it to specific apps to get it to only launch for those apps, i.e. like Kindle, or add it to the notification shade and toggle it from there for the entire system. Honestly though, whenever I turn it on, all it seems to do is turn everything black and white, which is good for reading, so maybe that's what it's supposed to do? I'm not sure. Gaming mode. Blocks notifications while enabled so that you can, for example, play a game without the floating notification popping up over the game and causing you to say, miss the shot. You can also use it to lock screen brightness, limit other apps from using the internet to give more bandwidth to the game, adjust the resolution and framing of the games to increase battery life, as well as route incoming calls to speaker automatically so you can keep playing while answering a call. Also, like reading mode, you can add certain apps to automatically launch in it or activate it manually from the notification chain. Navigation bar and gestures. OnePlus has the usual options to remove the on-screen navigation bar at the bottom of the phone with a button you can add and use it to toggle it on or off, but they also went a step further borrowing a similar gesture model from Android P and potentially the iPhone 10. You can turn on navigation gestures to then remove the navigation bar entirely and swipe up from the bottom of the phone to go home, swipe up and hold to get to multitasking, and swipe up from either side of the bottom to go back. Next, we can press the power button twice for the camera. Now, as I briefly mentioned before, you can double tap the power button to quickly open the camera. You do need to enable this though in the button section of the settings as it's not enabled by default, but it's something small that I really like. Long press and double tap actions. So OnePlus has also added options to have actions happen whenever you long press or double tap on either the home, recents, or back buttons. Of course, you need to not use the gestures because you need those buttons to be available in order for this to work. Now, in addition to the double tap and long press options, they have gestures that you can use as shortcuts for things as well. You can long press on the fingerprint sensor to take a photo, handy for selfies, for example. Flip the phone over to mute it when ringing, swipe three fingers across the screen to screenshot it, and some off-screen gestures. So while the screen's off, you can double tap to wake it, something I turn on because it's handy when your phone has no buttons on the front to wake it up with. Draw two lines down to pause or play music. Or a greater than or less than sign to go back or forward a track. And you can draw an O, V, S, or M to launch different actions that you can choose from. Next we have a face unlock feature, which is standard on a lot of Android phones now, uh, and it works pretty quick. Smart lock, which lets you choose certain scenarios to keep the device unlocked when it's near, say, trusted devices via Bluetooth, at a trusted location, or that it can tell that it's on your body, or even if it hears your voice. And finally, in here we have App Locker, which allows you to select specific apps that will not open unless the pin for the device lock screen or fingerprint are used. They then stay unlocked until the phone screen goes off again, by the way. Which brings us to the rear cameras. We have a 16 megapixel f1.7 aperture optically and electronically stabilized main camera, which is nice, and a 20 megapixel f1.7 aperture secondary camera. Notice it's a secondary camera and not a telephoto ones like we've had before. As for the camera software, besides the one times two times button to crop in by two times quickly, we just have the following modes and settings. Timer, you can choose between three, five, and 10 second delays. Smile timer, which is only works on the front facing camera, but the timer is replaced by a smile timer that will take a photo either two or five seconds after it detects a smile in the frame. HDR, which you can turn on, off, or on auto. I'd recommend just leaving it on auto all the time. Aspect ratio, the options here for photos are four by three, 16 by nine, and one by one, which is also called square. Flash, now these are your basic flash controls that we're all used to on, off, and auto. Swiping up on the viewfinder gives us the following modes. Video. You can choose from 720p in 30 frames a second, 1080p in 30 frames a second, 1080p in 60 frames a second, 4K in 30 frames a second, or 4K in 60 frames a second. Photo, which is our normal auto mode. Portrait, which takes a subject and uses software to give a better bokeh effect behind them. Slow motion. Now you can shoot in either 1080p at 240 frames a second or 720p in 480 frames a second, which is really slow for it allowing you to record this up to a minute. 
The other devices in the market let you do 960 frames a second only if you do it in 0.2 second bursts. Uh, and then they usually only have 240 frames per second as an option for continuous slow motion recording. Pro mode. As we're used to, this lets you adjust camera settings manually like ISO, shutter speed, white balance, etc. Time lapse, this lets you shoot at a lower frame rate for a sped up video when done and can be shot in 1080p or 720p. Not sure if there's a difference in speed with either though as it doesn't seem so. And finally, panorama. Also, what we're used to seeing, this lets us take a photo and move the camera left or right and it'll stitch them together to create a much wider panoramic photo. Now after swiping up to get to the camera modes that I mentioned, you can also tap the gear icon at the top right to get to more settings. A lot of the ones are ones we're used to seeing, I'm gonna skip them, but some of the more standout ones are Quick Capture. Now this will have the camera automatically fire off the shutter whenever you double tap the power button to launch the camera. Rear Camera Beauty Mode. This applies beautification mode to the rear cameras instead of just the front one. Never turn this on. Invert photo lets you invert the photo when shooting with the front camera to more mimic a mirror. Save normal photo. This will save a normal photo along with the bokeh enhanced photo when shooting in portrait mode, which is handy. Histogram, which in pro mode, this will just show a histogram uh, in the viewfinder for exposure. Horizontal reference line, also in pro mode, will show you a line to help you horizontally align your photos. There you go. Sorry for the lateness on this. Again, shipping problems. But let me know what you guys thought of the OnePlus 6 in the comments below, as well as this walkthrough. Uh, I would love to hear from you guys if you want me to add things, take things away for future ones. Please let me know. Always love to hear from you guys. Um, shout out to WeWork for letting me film in the space. If you guys want a discount on a WeWork co-working location, which I've been a part of for about two years and I'm a big fan, this is not sponsored, uh, you can click the link below for up to 20% off your first year if you use that link. And you can schedule a free tour. There's no obligation. They're all over the world. It's cool. Um, otherwise though, really hope you guys enjoyed this. If you did, please thumbs up or share it. It's greatly appreciated. If you want more videos like this, please check out the rest of my channel. If you like what you see there, please subscribe and click the bell next to where subscribe so you get notified when I do new videos. As always though, regardless, thanks for watching.